Welcome to everyone, and uh, please join us in this extraordinary conversation with uh, John Elkin and Elon Musk, connected from uh, South <laughs> Texas. Thank you, John, and thank you, Elon. Good night, Elon. Hi, even exactly. <laughs> Thank you. John and Elon, they will share with us their views on the future. Both are industrial leaders committed to foster innovation, supporting change, with trust for the power of technology in helping us to solve problems and achieve progress. But before we start, please take note on the side of the code number that you can type on the slider to send us questions to our extraordinary and unique guest. Uh, let's start from a personal note uh, from John. John, how and when did you meet with Elon? We met in, in Italy, in Sicily, in 2014 after the World Cup, and uh, we had immediately a very interesting conversation that we carried forward over the years, and the themes were artificial intelligence, uh, human machine interfaces, the future of our species in uh, a multi planet system. And what's been really good over the years is to see how uh, that conversation and what we had discussed then ended up in, in actual real activities. Uh, after that, OpenAI was started, Neuralink was started, and, and many other projects and ventures that Elon has achieved since. And Elon, what memories do you have of your conversation with John? Well, um... It's similar. Um, I think we're um, talking about those subjects, and I, I um, just thought that John was a great person and um, quite insightful. Um, but yes, at that point, uh, we were really, um, you know, Tesla was small, SpaceX was relatively small, there was no new, like, no boring company. Um, so I think it was just a wide-ranging intellectual conversation, and I was just impressed with uh, uh, John as a person. Speaking about roots, there are similarities between Elon Musk and John Elkin. Both grew up in developing countries, uh, in South Africa and Brazil. Both have one brother and one sister, strong affection for grandfather. Both are engineering-minded. Elon, what is the source of your inspiration? The source of my inspiration, I'd say, is um, somewhat philosophical. Um, the, um, so I think that, that, that the, <clears throat> uh, the thing we should be aiming for is uh, increasing the scope and scale of human civilization um, so as to best uh, ask the qu the right questions for the answer, which is reality um, or the universe. Um, and so, if you accept that uh, premise, then then we should work to ensure the long term survival and prosperity of humanity, uh, of consciousness, and we should uh, seek to extend that consciousness beyond Earth to other planets, eventually other star systems. Um, that is uh, the nature of my philosophy. John, what does it mean to grow up in changing places, cultures, languages? How that contributed to shape your character? Well, it definitely broadens one's scope in, in terms of the possibility of being exposed to different cultures different countries, different people. And as I reflect on, on the luck of my upbringing in, in multiple countries, 
what really st stays with me is that we generally tend to compare one place to another, what is better. And I think that that's a mistake. We really uh, need to appreciate what's different. And there's no doubt by complementing diversity, we end up getting to better outcomes. And I also think that having studied here in Torino engineering and having been li living here since, the, the element of roots is also important. So as much as one wants to extend ourselves in, in planet Earth, but beyond, uh, the roots, roots are, are, are important and are an important factor that I've come to appreciate more over the years. Exploration means moon, Mars, and beyond but also the art of chasing curiosity. Elon, you are committed to take humans to Mars. What comes after Mars? Well, I think the, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just exploration. Um, it's actually uh, ex extending the scope and scale of consciousness um, and the likely present, the likely, um, the length of time that consciousness will exist as we know it uh, is greatly extended by being a multi-planet species. Um, so it, it's, but it is, it is much harder to go and establish a, a uh, self-sustaining city on Mars than it is to um, simply explore Mars or, or go for a visit. Um, I think we need to turn Mars into another planet with life as we know it. Um, it and it's the only real possible location in the, in the solar system where that is possible, where, where that can be done. So only one planet really, Mars. So if we are able to establish a self-sustaining civilization on Mars, I think this will uh, go, go a long way towards securing the long-term uh, survival of, of humanity. And as I said, it would increase the scope and scale of consciousness um, and would drive the development of new technologies that would ultimately enable us to go further, uh, certainly further in the solar system, but, but ultimately to go to other star systems and, and just go out there and, and find out what's going on, you know? Um, are there other civilizations that existed perhaps hundreds of millions of years ago or a billion years ago that uh, um, maybe lasted for a long time? It might have lasted for millions of years. Um, whereas if you look at human civilization, it has only been around for about uh, 5,000 years if you consider civilization to have begun from when the first uh, writing existed. Um, first, writing in meaningful, exi first writing in any meaningful sense existed about five, maybe 6,000 years ago. So it's a very short period of time considering that Earth is four and a half billion years old and the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So, uh, you know, so I think, I think we'd, we'd learn a lot about, the, you know, just kind of like what the heck is going on? Um, <laughs> where, um, you know, just we, we ultimately want, we want to go out there and, and see the other star systems in our galaxy. I'm not sure we will ever get beyond our galaxy, but at least see what's happening in the, the great many stars that are in our galaxy. Maybe we'll meet some alien life that we can talk to. That would be interesting. We're going to see. Thank you, Len. John, what is your long-term ambition? I, mean, I, I think just if, if we're able, uh, the real threshold to be able to, um, to get to other, other places is transportation. So if one could actually invent teleportation, uh, that would allow us to uh, travel much easier and be able to explore definitely our, our solar system and potentially meet with other inhabitants as Elon was mentioning. So definitely if teleportation was something we could invent, that would be uh, a great progress. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Uh, speaking about business, you both are in charge of several businesses. Uh, Elon 
We speak about Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, Starlink, and others. John, Stellantis, Ferrari, an extra that means the CNH, Jedi, reinsurance companies, Juventus, and others. Elon, the question for you is, I mean, you mostly created new companies. What is your recipe yeah. for that? What is my recipe? Yeah. To um, hmm. Well, I, I think it's quite difficult to create a new company and have it be successful. Um, and generally, I do not recommend uh, creating new companies unless you feel very compelled to do so. Um, starting a new company and making it successful, um, a, a friend of mine has a good thing for that, which is it's like eating glass and staring into the abyss. So if that sounds like something you want to do, then start a company. <laughs> um, so it's, it's quite difficult. Um, but I mean, the, the basics of starting a company are, um, you know, you have to have an idea that is compelling or you think that could be a product that could be very valuable to the world. Um, and then you've got to find a lot of talented people and convince them to do this new thing that, because talented people are already doing something. So you have to convince them to do this new thing. Um, and that, that can be quite, it's very hard to, to do that. Um, and, then, and then you have to build the company up and a company goes through a life cycle, like a, you know, like just a, sort of a, like a human or like any animal. Um, it starts off very simple, like one cell, then you get a few more cells, um, and then it, uh, you get some um, organ differentiation, you start growing arms and legs, and they become like a baby, uh, and then a toddler, you know, a child and teenager, adult. It's, it's, it, the life cycle of a company is very much like that of a creature, and you have to reinvent the company at every stage. So this is why you know some companies get to be a large size and some do not. Um, it's because you actually have to reconfigure the country at the various stages of its life cycle. John, yeah. you mostly transformed existing companies. What is your recipe? Well, I, I think um, I, I've been mainly exposed professionally to uh, two industries. The uh, car industry and the newspaper industry, uh, which are old industries. So they come from the 19th century. And uh, I studied engineering 20 years ago here in Torino, where two things were very true then. One was the internet, and the other one was mobile. And that led to incredible things that happened on the back of it. Uh, whilst I was very much immersed in, uh, in, in two industries who were very much suffering from structural reasons and a lot of headwinds. And I think that what was useful was that in parallel to what I was doing, I also had the opportunity of being exposed to what was happening in, in other industries. And as I reflect about a company, and our companies are old, they, they have more than 100, 100 centuries, uh, this moment in time and the decade we're in is a very exciting one for the opportunity of renewal that, that it gives. And, and you can see that transformation is incredibly, uh, if, if you are very committed to it, which is really the, the difficulty in, in a company which has very strong embedded habits, uh, is, is able to give you great benefits. Having said that, it is incredibly painful so I'm also happy that we're not only trying to transform 19th century companies and 21st century companies, but also since 2017 with XOR Seeds, participating in new companies and, and trying to build 21st century companies. Thank you. Speaking about business, we are in front of a public today of startup, an audience of leaders, mostly young, that take risk, overcome problems, and look for solutions. You are both roller coasters, used to go from risk 
to successes. John, you have survived three different crises. What does it mean for you that? Well, to some, to some extent, more than only free. Uh, and I think that being a, an entrepreneur and, and taking an active role in, in engaging in, in an enterprise has, has risk in it, uh, which is why it's very hard, as Elon, Elon was mentioning before. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think that it's very important to be aware that you are on a roller coaster, and one of the mistakes uh, that one should not do is when you're on the low, uh, be depressed, or when you're on the high, be overexcited. And, and if you're able to balance that and, and stay very true to what you're doing and what you're doing with the organization, that's extremely important. I also believe that having, hand, having been very close to uh, very complicated situation and when you really see an organization that could end its life uh, because you don't have resources to continue or for other other troubles but generally they are they end up being financial uh, difficulties it, it is very important to to have very strong conviction and and find all all kind of resourcefulness uh, to, to go along and, and, and that's something I've experimented many times and I recall very well being with Elon in 2019 which was definitely a tough year for him and, yeah. and you, were, you were very calm and, and, and I think that's important to be very, very steady. Yeah, speaking about uh, you, Elon, in 2019 and also 2008, I mean, 2008, when many people rode off Tesla. How could you reverse the situation then? Um, yeah, that was a very difficult time. Um, I think, uh, you know, like John, uh, we've, we've gone through many difficult times. Um, the Tesla has come close to bankruptcy, I don't know, maybe half a dozen times uh, over its life. Um, and I, actually, probably the, the most uh, serious one was uh, 2008 um, and 2009 because Tesla was just a very small company making uh, in low volume um, a sports car that was you know, kind of expensive um, and the, uh, that was basically the only electric car being built at the time. Um, so it was very difficult to uh, get customers and very difficult to get investors and um, Although I had money from uh, PayPal, I had actually run out of the money from PayPal. So I personally had no money left. Um, in fact, I had to borrow money from friends to pay the rent. I didn't even have a house. Um, so it was pretty intense. And like in that case, we actually raised the money to get to keep the company going on Christmas Eve of 2008. And that was the last hour of the last day that it was possible to raise money. And if that call had not gone well, then we would have gone bankrupt. <laughs> that was pretty intense. Um, and then the next most intense time was, yeah, the uh, 2018, 2019, um, when we were struggling to get the Model 3 to volume production. And so we were really uh, in a very tough situation. Um, because the, the thing that's uh, I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate is that while it's actually relatively easy to come up with prototypes and show cars, it is very difficult to achieve volume manufacturing. Um, the, the notable thing I think about Tesla is not so much that Tesla you know, made electric cars, because others have made electric cars, but rather that uh, Tesla was able to uh, achieve volume manufacturing, I think, as the first U.S. company uh, to achieve volume manufacturing in 100 years after Chrysler in the 20s. Um, so the difficulty of this cannot be uh, overstated. Um, it's, it, production is staggeringly hard, and I have a great deal of respect for people who, or companies and people that are able to do volume production and make good products and, um, and actually be prosperous. It's very difficult. Um, 
So it's just one one thing after another. Um, yeah, and I'd say probably the, the, the longest extended period of pain that I've had is from 2017 to 2019. Um, just about three, almost three years there. Um, and um, actually, it was great talking to John, actually. And John, John was uh, very supportive. <laughs> um, and um, so. And on that manufacturing, we, we are very happy as Comal to be part of of how you guys sorted it out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, could come out was great. So, um, yeah, but very, very tough. Um, you know, the thing about it, that's one of the things that makes uh, cars especially difficult for manufacturing is that there are on the order of 10,000 unique uh, parts or, or processes in vehicle production. And if even one of those has a problem, you cannot make the car. So, the <clears throat> Production moves as fast as the slowest, uh, least lucky, least competent of, let's say, at least 10,000 unique parts and processes, some of which are, in your, are within your control and some of which are uh, at suppliers. Um, so it's just very hard. <laughs> um, I was could... sleeping in the factory for quite a while there. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. A crucial topic for all of us today is energy. We know that electric energy is the future for cars. And we know very well that we have to cut emission. But how can we produce enough energy to sustain growth? Elon. Yeah, I think that the long, long term, we'll get most of our energy from solar um, and wind, in addition to geothermal uh, and hydropower. And I would say also, um, people should really think uh, positively of nuclear energy. Um, I'm talking about just, you know, traditional nu nuclear energy that's well engineered. Um, and, uh, you know, I think these days there's, recently I've been surprised by a movement away from nuclear energy, but I, I think actually the reality is it is actually quite safe um, and we should have more nuclear energy, um, or at least not shut down the nuclear power plants that we already have. Um, you know, my considered opinion is that they do not present a danger. Um, so but there's a strong movement to get rid of nuclear power plants, which I think is, is not good, um, especially if they are to be replaced with uh, coal power plants. Um, I think the evidence is very clear that uh, there's much more of a health risk from coal power plants than there's from nuclear. And John, how to face the challenge of the need for more energy today? Well, I, I, I think that energy is is important for us to be able to continue and develop as as we have and and we have two important uh, issues to tackle one is price and we're seeing how energy prices are just going up uh, in in gas coal uh, uranium everything is is going up and the second one is how do we make sure that we are able to produce energy with no, with no emission. And so on one hand, th there can be mechanisms of carbon capturing, but more importantly, how can we produce energy without, uh, without having to emit uh, CO2? And no doubt, I, I agree with Elon that uh, nuclear is, is a solution that exists. It's one that we know, it's one that it's secure, and, and one that we should absolutely develop uh, strongly, and if you think about why uranium prices are going up, which means that there is nuclearization in the world, it's because countries like China and India are actually nuclearizing, and and that is a very strong indication of also what we should do. As in parallel, we do work very strongly on renewable, and and I think that ultimately the sun, which is the biggest source of energy. Is, is going yeah. to be the long-term solution. Do you agree on that, Ian? Yeah. yeah, I think very much so. Um, solar energy is uh, often underestimated, um, but the Earth would be just a cold, a cold, dark ice ball at three degrees above absolute zero if it was not for the sun. And the sun also uh, powers almost the entire ecosystem. You know, from the if sun, the sun powers the, the plants and the plankton 
and then from there the, the whole ecosystem above plants and plankton. Um, so you can think of really uh, Earth as being already almost entirely solar powered, and so to but then there's like a little bit of extra power that's needed to power human civilization, uh, which is small compared to the total solar incidence on this on Earth. Um, you know, the, the solar energy on Earth is approximately a um, gigawatt per square kilometer. Um, and if you wanted to, say, power uh, all of Europe um, with solar, you would only need a fairly small piece of um, uh, land, uh, you know, uh, but uh, like, like in, re in reality, it would be distributed over, over many, many pieces of land, so you don't have to have long, uh, too many long power lines. But basically, like as a rough um, uh, guide, about 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers of solar would would power all of Europe. Um, maybe even a little bit less, but comfortably 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers of, of solar would power all of Europe. So, um, you know, this could be a combination of land within Europe or perhaps uh, just across the Mediterranean um, where there's a lot of sun. Um, there's, uh, but basically there's so much solar that you could very, very easily with a very small patch of land, uh, relatively speaking, power all of, all of Europe, all of the world, in fact. Um, so this is important to appreciate that uh, only a, a very small portion of the world would need to, uh, may need to have solar panels to, to power all of civilization. And then um, an even smaller piece of land would be required for the batteries re required to store that solar energy overnight so that you could have energy at night and during the day. Coming to the new horizons of life, Neuralink is a developing brain-computer neural interfaces. Uh, how can human beings interact with machine, Ilan? Sure. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, the, the full story of Neuralink is quite complicated. Um, the overarching goal of Neuralink is to mitigate um, the uh, AI control risk, so that uh, as AI gets smarter and smarter, um, we are we need to do something about to, to enhance the bandwidth between ourselves and the um, machine extension of ourselves. Like we are already a cyborg to some degree, um, in that uh, our phones and our laptops and our, our computer applications are an extension of ourselves. But the the bandwidth to the computers, especially to the phone, is very slow, um, where we essentially are outputting with just with thumbs, too slow moving thumbs. This is a very low bandwidth situation. So I think um, from an existential threat standpoint, Neuralink is aimed at um, improving uh, human machine symbiosis um, with the idea of um, ensuring that humanity uh, can uh, have a good co good coexistence with artificial intelligence. Um, now, in the short term, uh, over, the, over the next several years, uh, Neuralink will attempt to solve a number of uh, brain injuries and, and brain diseases. Uh, so our first application, for example, is to enable uh, someone who is um, a quadriplegic or tetraplegic to be able to control their computer or their phone just by thinking. Um, and we've already demonstrated this actually with a monkey that can play video games and use a mouse cursor and click on things on a computer. Um, and so we're very confident this will work. And hopefully we'll have our first uh, human trials uh, in the next uh, six months or so. It's a, it's a fascinating scenario. John, how do you see the cyborg world? <laughs> well, I, I think that we are in a decade where we're going to see the evolution of our smartphones, which is the first uh, application of being cyborgs, uh, change. And how, how will that object evolve? Uh, you could argue that it's going to be with, you know, we have all these glasses that are going to allow us to use AR and VR technologies, or as an extension of what Neuralink is doing, we could actually ourselves uh, be, be enabled with technology. But as I reflect on all of these um, evolutions and how we humans can uh, work and cooperate more with machines, 
What I also find very interesting, and the avenue that all of this could open, is that you think <coughs> about our relationship with nature. Uh, aren't these technologies also going to help us understand better nature? And if you could actually communicate with your dog or with your trees, wouldn't that open <laughs> up a whole universe? Sure. It's a window on, on the future opportunities that we may... Do you want to share the animal, Elon, that the Neuralink team is more, would be most excited in communicating with? Well, um, you know, I think the things that animals want to communicate with, as far as we can tell, tend to be fairly straightforward. Um, probably um, monkeys are the most sophisticated. Um, but I think you could uh, you could communicate with your dog, I suppose. Um, although I think I think I know what my dog would want. Um, <laughs> you know, he only wants like about four different things. <laughs> it's like food, water, go outside, you know, and be petted. Um, but maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe he has a secret life of dogs that we just don't know that exists. We may discover it very soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This conference was made to inspire and empower anyone who believes in a future where technology and innovation expand human possibilities. You both are father with strong relations with your kids. What future do you see for them, John? Well, I'm, I'm very optimistic uh, about the future, and I think that uh, our, our species has been able to overcome difficulties as, as they come. And the last example of it is what we all have been living through this pandemic. And it's extraordinary to see the resourcefulness and, and how we've come together to mitigate the risks and, and finding practical solutions to be able to uh, solve problems and, and advance. And, and this is what gives me a huge amount of optimism, optimism combined with really seeing uh, younger, younger generations. So if I think about my kids, their friends, also all the young uh, women and men that I've interacted with yesterday and today, and, and how clever they are, and also their ambition in, in being forces of good, that, that gives me a, a lot of confidence in, in our future. Elon? Yeah, I, I also, um, I believe one should be optimistic about the future. Um, I mean, I'm generally of the view, philosophically, philosophically, that it's better to be optimistic and wrong occasionally than pessimistic and right. Um, you know, uh, you could, I think you want to look on the bright, th bright side of things. And, um, and I'm a little worried that, um, uh, young people today maybe sometimes are a little pessimistic about the future, but I, 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 I'd like to just assure people that so long as we are not complacent, we will solve the climate, we'll solve the climate crisis and we will solve these issues. Um, we also need to take them seriously and work hard to solve them, but they will be solved. Um, and that people should be optimistic about the future and, and work to make that uh, optimistic future real. You know, they say that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, and so if you take the actions necessary for there to be a good future, then we will have a good future. Um, and um, so I'd encourage people to be optimistic, take the actions that will create a good future, and we will have one. Thank you, Elin. We got a few questions from the audience. The first one is for you both. How do you learn? What is your way to the process information to make the right question and find the answer? John? Well, I, I, I'm very eager to, to learn and have had the good fortune of being exposed to many different situations out of which I've always found that by doing, you learn. But more importantly, I, I, I think that interaction with people and, and going to sources of knowledge. Uh, and, and, and there are incredible masters, teachers that you can learn from. 
And as, as you have those interactions, I, I agree that the questions, like how you, you ask, what you ask, and being generally interested. Now, you have the risk of some people asking questions because they like to hear what they're asking, but if you generally want to hear the answer, uh, that's been for me the, the biggest learning opportunity I've had, Maurizio. Elon. Yeah, um, I, I think you really want to try to learn at every opportunity, and um, you know it's it's great to um, read books and talk to interesting people and uh, learn as much as possible, um, and. Um, you know, I suppose it was, uh, I don't know, Plato or someone who said, um, or maybe attributed to Socrates, um, if, I, if I know anything, it's that I know nothing. Um, and so essentially, uh, just taking the attitude that um, really, we, we wish to be less foolish over time. <laughs> um, but it, I think it's actually, if, I'm like, if you accept the premise that you were a fool, <laughs> then we are all to a fool to some degree, then I think that, and you wish to be less foolish, then uh, that's a, I think that's a good approach, you know? And, um, and this, this avoids, this, that maximizes your feedback loop and, and your ability to learn. Um, as soon as you start thinking you know too much, and people can't teach, teach you things, that's when you start getting very dumb. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I always try to learn learn new things and, um, and and being able to talk to interesting people, and and you can often learn more by the questions that are asked than the answers that are given. A question for uh, Elon Musk: Suppose to be twenty years old right now, where would you start your path from? I mean, if I was literally just so if I was just a twenty-year-old right now in twenty twenty-one. Correct. Post 21 and 2021. <laughs> From where would um, you start? Um, hmm. Well, I mean, assuming that I'm still a technologist, then I think there's um, a lot of opportunity in synthetic uh, RNA. Um, the you know the vaccines that were developed apart from you know, that the, the, one, the ones that were done by BioNTech and um, Moderna um, are really the beginning of what I call digital medicine, or medicine and software. And I think that's I would say what's the single biggest opportunity I see right now? It's probably um, synthetic RNA um, and. Uh, the potential for revolutionizing medicine in that way. Um, there's also artificial intelligence. Um, there's one of my favorites that, it, it, which is tunnels. <laughs> um, we need a lot of tunnels to address the traffic in in major cities. Um, and then there's obviously the, the continued electrification of transport uh, with aircraft and boats, um, in addition to cars. Um, let's see. There's many other things that will come up as well. So, I li we think we live at a very exciting time. In, uh, you know, if you look at the whole history of the world and hum you know, humanity, this is a time of the greatest technological growth in history, um, and it seems to be accelerating. A question for John Elkan. Will we ever see an autonomous Ferrari car? Well, that, uh -huh. that would be sad to have a, a Ferrari autonomous car uh, as the essence of having a, a Ferrari <laughs> is to be able to drive it. And, and, and I think that in a world where autonomy will, will capture a bigger part of, of how we move, uh, the value of driving will increase. So if we go by analogy, uh, when we were, uh, when we had horses and carriages, um, 
stallions existed too and, and racehorses existed, but as those disappeared, uh, stallions and racehorses continue to exist and, and are very valuable and very appreciated. So to some extent, that's where I think Ferrari is and, and should continue being. Yeah, I, I agreed. It's on the logo. <laughs> <laughs> We have time for just two short final questions. Um, Elon Musk, it has been reported that you consider yourself not a CEO, but an engineer for the ability of problem solving. How do you find these skills in your candidates, people that want to work with you? How, how do I find uh, engineering skills with um, The ability well, of problem we, solving. Oh, yeah, um, generally, um, my view generally consists of just asking people to tell me the story of their career and um, in particular to go into depth on some of the toughest problems that they've solved and how they solve them. Um, and then that, uh, that gives me pretty good insight into what they can do. And then I'll, I'll generally ask them you know, detailed questions about some problem that they solved uh, technologically and that will tell me if they were really responsible or not, um, because whoever was actually responsible for, for solving the problem, they they remember it very well. It's like seared into their brain. Um, so um, that that that's I think a good sort of filter for, okay, who really deserves credit for a problem and who's not, uh, if they can answer the small detailed questions. Um, yeah. Then and and then we have a very crucial question, by the way. Um, about semiconductors, cr the crisis of semiconductor production. Is a short term or a long term standing? Short term, I think. Yes, uh, short term. There's a lot of um, chip uh, fabrication plants that are being built. Um, and I think we will have uh, good capacity for pr providing uh, chips uh, by next year, I think. Uh, I certainly hope so, but it appears that way. And finally, Ellen, do you want to tell something else about your relation with Italy and if you will invest in Italy as one of the members of the public or ask it us? Uh, sure, well, I think uh, uh, I, I love Italy, it's great. Um, in fact, I asked um, uh, Mauro, who is uh, head of the uh, heat shield technology at SpaceX uh, to join, and he's from Italy. So, Mauro, if you could join. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Hi. I'm ready to come to the Italian. Buonanotte. Yeah. Good morning. Waking <laughs> <laughs> up. Sorry. But you can speak in Italian, though. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Buongiorno. <laughs> Buongiorno. Um, so. And, and uh, Mara, actually, you came from a small village, right? Yeah, I came from a small village in the north of uh, Piemonte, in Valdossola, Valformazza. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which, yeah. which, is, which is in the same region Torino is in. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Yeah. But I think it's funny, like, like um, just think about like you, you grew up in, I mean, and your family's been there for a long time. Yeah, like several hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> several hundred years in the village. Yes. And uh, and then you, but you decided you wanted to work on technology. Yeah, and uh, just decide to explore yeah. opportunities. So went to university in Milan, then went to Caltech in. Um, in California, and then I stay at NASA, and then I realized the rate of learning was a little slow. So I'm very happy to be with, with joint SpaceX for several years and work together. Can you yeah, tell, uh, can you tell us what he does for, in your team? Oh yes, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, should, should Mara talk in, in, in Italian for a bit? Or that would it, be great. That would okay. that would be wonderful. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, seguo tutto lo sviluppo 
So I'm responsible for the development of uh, vehicles. So when they have to stop and uh, burn. And so I develop materials, how to create them, how to reuse them. E anche ispirato dalla ceramica, no? And also you have the ins uh, true inspiration from ceramics, is that right? Yes, we are making these tiles, hexagonal black tiles, that you probably have seen on Starship. And we learned uh, so how they make uh, tiles in Imola, Sassuolo, Italy, also how they are painting the panels of Italian kitchens and uh, how you can reconvert um, facilities that were making condensed milk to recover uh, acid that was used to purify the fibers and uh, how to use uh, oil tanks to grind fibers we bought in Bari. So we put together many things and learned, we've learned um, from many years of history. And we actually bought it in but, Scotland, but was previously used in Croatia. But like, like for the, the you know, we, like we're making some of the most advanced heat shield technology, the, in fact, the most technology in, in the world. Um, but we're using a lot of techniques uh, that are also developed for roofing tiles. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of those techniques were developed in Italy, actually. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> learning from everybody you can learn from. There is great pride in the room here of, of knowing that part of Italy is also with SpaceX and, and, and a lot of eagerness of being able to participate more in, and doing more to that end. Yep. Thank you. Very happy to be here. <laughs> now and and i i hope that you guys will come to torino next year to be able to see how ideally we can we can do more and torino is the capital of space of italy and it's also the capital of uh, capital of cars which are two important passions for elon but we had prepared also torino being the capital of chocolate and knowing you like <laughs> Peperano chocolate. Sure. We we Absolutely. have this very special space chocolate that will be waiting <laughs> okay, cool. for you, you when when you come next time. All right. I look look forward to being there in person. Very good. Gra thank you. Grazie. Ilan. Thank you, Janelka. Thank you to your extraordinary Italian assistants, and thank you all for having been with us today. <laughs> all right. Great. Thanks, it's good to, good to talk to you. Bye. Buonanotte. Buonanotte. <laughs>